Northern Ireland casualties in 12 years from 1969, over 17,000 injured, over 2,000 killed. One has just got to be blunt, almost brutal at times, uh, through the night, telling you your wife has lost both her legs. Your young son has been killed in an explosion. This is the sort of situation which we're faced with almost daily in this hospital. I don't think one can be otherwise and very severely affected by this sort of situation. It's tragic. One or two frightful experiences with children, taking a father to the morgue to identify his only child, who was unidentifiable following an explosion. The mother was in the theater. She was severely injured. Her only child and a neighbor's child were both killed in an explosion. And the father had to identify his only child. A most tiring experience. Most victims have been targets of the IRA. This series has looked into history to see how such horrors of which Ireland has seen so many down the centuries, could continue into our own time. I'm too old to be engaged in a fight, and I'm not going to criticize men who are fighting. The odds they are fighting is enormous. The objective they are fighting is dear to my heart. And it doesn't matter what war or what fight you go into, it's very hard to condone everything that happens in a fight. I don't know. I, I don't agree with the tactics that in the first place. I don't agree with Phyllis throwing a bomb into a, a pub where there's a crowd of people, innocent people. All right, if they go out and meet the other Philippi's armed and have a fair go, but that's being honest about it, I don't agree with the it's bombing business. Too many innocent people get knocked out. This thing, I cannot stand it. I have no sympathy with it in any shape or form. They destroy the name of the IRA. They should have been never allowed to call themselves IRA men at all. They are preventing the ultimate union of the Irish people. Now, I don't mean terribly, but the union of hearts and minds, about which a which is necessary if a nation is going to survive. And we want to build an Irish nation. We have still to build an Irish nation. We have, we have two traditions, and they must be welded. The, the reason why this is deteriorated, if you like, into, into such confrontation, vicious confrontation with the state, was basically because those veterans inside of the, the old IRA failed. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had it to come to this. Had they literally stuck to their guns in 1921, had they opposed partition, they wouldn't have left us with the disaster which has been on our hands, our parents' and our grandparents' hands for this last 50 years. Fina Foyle, the party in today's Irish Republic descended from the old IRA, long ago exchanged violence for argument and rhetoric, a rhetoric which expresses deep inner feelings. For over 60 years now, the situation in Northern Ireland has been a source of instability, real or potential, in these islands. It has been so because the very entity itself is artificial and has been artificially sustained. <laughs> we must face the reality that Northern Ireland as a political entity has failed and that a new beginning is needed. In my view, a declaration by the British government of their interest in encouraging the unity of Ireland by agreement and in peace. By agreement and in peace. <laughs> would open the way, would open the way towards an entirely new situation in which peace 
real lasting peace would at last become an attainable reality. I've just driven up this road here from the Republic. There was no visible frontier. No one stopped us and said, you're leaving Ireland, and we weren't. This is Ireland, just as that is Ireland. So just imagine yourself as a citizen of the Republic, coming up here and seeing all these Union Jacks. The Union Jack of which your country, as you know it, was rid long ago. Whatever you might think about the present IRA and its activities, you wouldn't much like those Union Jacks. Why do these Union Jacks fly here? Why is this part of Ireland still legally under British sovereignty? It's not just that partition and the border were legally accepted by an Irish government over 50 years ago. They were so accepted because two-thirds of the people who live in this part of the beautiful province of Ulster, Protestants, don't want to be part of a free United Ireland at all. Their ancestors came here as settlers hundreds of years ago. Today, as Protestants, they want to live in their own way, in what they regard as their own part of the United Kingdom. Ballymena in County Antrim, where that way of life can be taken for granted. We pray for 30 people, I hope pray for like that. And where the conflict of today in Northern Ireland can sometimes seem remote beside the even tenor of ordinary life as lived by people who are happy to live here. Who'll bid only two fifty? Here, Liddy. Here. Charge of two pound only. Other four snippies. Other four snippies over there again. And only two pound again. Who else now for snippies? Nelly. Could you go wrong? The area also has a Catholic minority whose ancestors were here before the Protestant settlers and who've retained the old Catholic religion as part of a different identity. The council, on which only two Catholics sit, is concerned with everyday matters of the community. I'm sure we would like to congratulate William Hood of Bally, Bally Mountain at Grace Hill, chosen to represent Northern Ireland at the 1981 World Clown Match. And this is something of an achievement, especially we people who are farmers. We're always proud of a local son of the soil doing well. Also, Clough Rangers were away on Saturday playing over in Scotland. I think this is the second time that they have been against the Glasgow Rangers and they have played very well and have brought back the cup. And uh, I'm sure we're delighted again to see them bring the cup back to the North Antrim town of Good Clough. Grievances are not necessarily political. I, my telephone has never stopped ringing. The people have been saying, where's the gutter? Why are we not getting our roads cut? Some people couldn't get out yesterday to go to church. The roads were so bad. And when matters such as the RUC and the government are brought up, it's unlikely to be in the usual Northern Ireland context. The RUC are putting in a big effort to, to try and protect people's lives. Quite rightly, I am towards everything that's been done by them and that and this, but it seems to me illogical that the government then should curtail or the department should curtail that the, the money for gritting, which I contend would be a very, very vital in the interest of, of uh, safety and protection of people's lives whenever there is a severe frost and no doubt the roads were inadequately gritted. We seem to be a different people in the north of Ireland, a different people from the southern people the majority are Protestant who go to their different churches of different denominations. There's still the old tradition that we keep the Lord's Day holy. Remember the book, the good book says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And I think all the people in the area like to keep the, the first day of the week free for church activities. There's six days a week for all the rest of the amusement. I'm a Christian, and I believe a people who honour and honour God and honour God's laws will always prosper. And as soon as a church begins to bring in other gimmicks, the free Presbyterian have no gimmicks in their churches. They preach the pure, true, holy word of God. And I believe a church or a people or a minister who does this 
the people will come to hear the word of God. And the word of God is quick and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. writer penned those words, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure again? My friend, nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Or would you be in heaven? Then there's no other way of preparing save in the blood of the Lord. This old sin-sick soul of ours, this old blackened, depraved, a heart of ours, it can only be washed clean, only be made ready for heaven, can only <clears throat> be accepted by the Lord if it's washed and washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Catholics here, like these boys playing Gaelic football, have to accept a secondary place in this self-contained Protestant community. Council playgrounds aren't available for Gaelic football, traditionally played on a Sunday. Well, when we started here, we, we applied to the local council for permission or, or for playing pitches, for playing facilities. And uh, they turned us down right away because we were a Gaelic athletic club. Uh, they said that the constitution of the GA was contrary to uh, British rules and laws and that they, weren't, they wouldn't have anything to do with us. Their argument is that the, the GA has no part in, in the, the community of Northern Ireland and as such that, that they're not going to provide any facilities at all whatsoever for Gaelic games in Northern Ireland. It's happened so often in this land. It happened so often that the Gaelic games are thrown out. and don't want to know about this. For the Protestant majority in Northern Ireland, the tradition is not Gaelic, but Unionist and British. Well, I'm a Unionist, first of all, because I'm British. I was born British. My family have been for hundreds and hundreds of years British. But in the present day context, why am I British? I'm British because I'm loyal to the Crown. Secondly, uh, it is an advantage to the people of Northern Ireland to be British in economic terms. There are many economic benefits from being part of the United Kingdom. And thirdly, of course, as a practicing Christian, as a member of one of the Protestant communions in Northern Ireland, I would uh, oppose strongly the Roman Catholic influence that permeates all aspects of Southern Irish life today, and I wouldn't want that extended to the society in which I lived. I wouldn't like to bring my children up in that type of atmosphere. To preserve and defend to the death the way of life in Ireland in which they believe, Protestants and Unionists are prepared to die, and do die, in Northern Ireland's own security forces. 247 members of the Ulster Defence Regiment and of the Royal Ulster Constabulary were killed by the IRA in 12 years to the end of 1980. And it's against the UDR and the RUC that the IRA have been increasingly concentrating their campaign. RUC Detective Constable Norman Prue was killed in 1979. Well, it was um, 6th of May, just an ordinary Sunday morning. Norman went out to work and my little girl went to Sunday school. And um, my parents were up to set me again. <laughs> because oh, this is dreadful. It had been uh, Shelley had been eight on the Saturday, and um, they say Norman he went out to work, and Shelley went to Sunday school. My parents went up to collect her, and then they take the children down to the park while I made the lunch. And so for about twenty to twelve, a knock came to the front door, and I presumed it was my parents' back. And I opened the door and two policemen were standing. And uh, they took me that Norman had been shot. 
outside the outside the chapel in the Snisky. He was shot an army colleague and him. They just stopped the car and they opened up on them. Total killed by the violence in Northern Ireland in 12 years to the end of 1980, 2070. Of these, 584 or 28% have been killed by loyalist paramilitary groups. 227 or 11% have been killed by the army and security forces. 1,068, or over 50%, have been killed by the IRA and similar Republican groups. The rest are unclassified. That is, the IRA have killed more than all the other groups put together. The IRA, too, are prepared to die for what they believe in. Sean McDermott had placed a bomb in a hotel and tried to make good his escape. Sean and his uh, comrades uh, went to an adjoining house uh, to seek transport to get away because uh, their own, they couldn't use their own because their plans were foiled because of the arrival of the security forces. And um, they went to the adjoining house anyway, as I said, and the man answer the door, they asked for his car, and as far as I'm told, he said, yes, come upstairs, I'll get you the keys. And uh, he opened his drawer and shot him. He was, he happened to be, a, it was the private house of a reserve policeman. So that was on the 5th of April, 76. And I heard about it on the television news. You Did know. you feel proud? Oh, well, afterwards, yes. The IRA is loyal to the traditional extreme Irish Republican belief that only violence against British sovereignty in Ireland can solve Ireland's problems. The IRA has a fluctuating but never negligible support from the Catholic and nationalist population. And the IRA has little difficulty for all its outlawed status in appearing at will to try and impress the media and bolster the morale of its supporters. We have support. We have a city of war. We have a gun. The IRA's cause is to build a nation with the common name of Irishmen. And to do so, they kill Catholic, Protestant and dissenter, and can still convince others that this is the right thing to do. The support for the IRA amongst the Roman Catholic community varies according to the time of year, to the way in which the IRA are succeeding. I think that, broadly speaking, there is general support amongst the vast majority of Roman Catholics for what the IRA are doing. However, you will find that if you carry out a public opinion poll, perhaps only 2 or 3% will say that they support the provisional IRA. And of course, during periods of particularly horrific incidents, you will find that many, many Roman Catholics condemn publicly the activities of the IRA, and support amongst the Roman Catholic community for their IRA fades away. But then it always seems to come back again. 
And uh, that's why I say that at the end of the day, if the IRA were doing well, I think you would find that the majority of Roman Catholics would be supporting it. At present, I think the support in the Roman Catholic community is very small, actually, for the IRA, but it does come and go according to success. An expletive against the Queen adorns the Bally Murphy estate in West Belfast, a constituency which nevertheless freely elects to Parliament Jerry Fitt, an Irish nationalist and Republican who has again and again spoken out bravely against the IRA's violence and who receives many letters of support from Catholics. Well, well, I can only look at uh, one of the particularly gratifying things which uh, has happened over this past few weeks has been the number of letters which I have got from my own constituency. And uh, they fully support it. Uh, I, I can read it. Many of these people wouldn't want their names uh, read out, but there's one of them from the good people of Divislats, which is a very socially deprived, poverty-ridden area in my own constituency. And the people are naturally frightened to put their own names on it, but they say from the good people of Divisplatz, Dear Jerry, we were very pleased indeed with your speech. You have spoken with the voice of all the good people in these block of flats. Again, from Bally Murphy. And Bally Murphy, again, is a socially deprived area. And the person has said to me, We have lived under the tyranny of the provisional IRA. Although there, this part of Belfast has a history of political problems through the years, the approvals never had and never will have a mandate to represent us. Yet it's not quite as simple as that. For the ordinary, unpolitical, Catholic and nationalist people of Belfast, the provisional IRA does represent some emotional aspiration with which they can quite easily identify. The line becomes blurred between what in the IRA's ideology is acceptable and what is not. Belfast is a predominantly Protestant and Unionist city, but drawn into it by its industrial development in the 19th century is a considerable Catholic and nationalist population which lives largely in the Andersonstown and Ballymurphy districts of West Belfast and in a small enclave called the Ardoin. Because the Ardoin lies behind makeshift defensive barriers which isolate the Catholics and nationalists who live there from Protestant loyalists and unionists on the other side of the fence, it's relatively easy for the provisional IRA to establish an effective presence here. The British Army attempts to establish an effective presence back. But inevitably, the army seemed to Catholics and nationalists who live here unwanted strangers, even oppressors, as the IRA say they are. And the isolation of the area from its loyalist and Protestant neighbors emphasizes this. No matter where we want to go, we must go through a loyalist area. You know, there's no safe route out of our down. So when the trouble's bad, we're sort of um, captured up in our down, you know. Even when it's quiet, you're still scared to go out, you know. People that work in the community and that, they go out frequent. But a lot of the people, I'm sure if you had took a, a census in our down, you'd find that some people, there's a lot of people that hasn't been out of our down from before the troubles, you know. Our down's their life. You gotta live in the area. There's things you wanna do, but you can't do. And, it's the Ardoin area, it's just living, it's, it's just a wee, wee place on its own, it has its own laws and its own tribal ways. These laws and tribal ways are largely enforced by the Republican paramilitaries of the IRA. There's very, very little crime in Ardoin, you know, that you, you, you don't come across that sort of um, worry, you know, you don't, uh, if something happens, it's really out, because the way we look at it, there's nobody brave enough to run around because if you're caught, you're kneecapped, you know, or you lost your elbow. You know, that, that, that's it in Ardoin. If you're caught, the paramilities, you know, torching the people living in Ardoin, you're, 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 you know what I mean, you're kneecapped. And there's not many kids in Ardoin who want to run around with their knees. You know, they've learned their lesson, they've caught ones doing it, and it sort of works here, you know. <laughs> That Catholic and nationalist woman runs a youth club in the Ardoin. 
but she doesn't want to isolate it from the Protestants on the other side. Our biggest ambition would be to have the kids from both sides of the road using this. Now, about a couple of weeks ago, we had about seven boys, youth from the other side, come in to have a look around. There was a hole in the fence at the time, and uh, away they went. They thought this place was magic. And a fortnight ago, we had two girls come in. We didn't know the girls from Adam. One had a skinhead and her mate, and they had a fantastic night. And they came back the next night, and uh, they were asking when the disco was. And it was one of our girls met them a couple of days after it in the bus. They were from the other side. They'd been in here two nights in a row, you know. We didn't know who they were they were in, and that was it. But uh, it worried us, because if somebody had a tick them and hit them, or somebody ganged up on them, you know, it's... It's not ripe yet, you know. Could the time ever be ripe? The Republicans have been able to demonstrate that reforms cannot be met within the six-county state. Therefore, the only solution is that that state must come down. And that's why, despite 10, 11 years of British Army occupation, despite, inter despite internment, the arrests of many activists, there's over, there's over 1,500 people experienced internment from the nationalist ghettos. The IRA is still able to draw upon the youth and draw upon people's houses for support to billet their men and to keep their arms. Now, of course, you don't have the support on the whole of the majority of the Irish people in this campaign, do you? For a lot of the methods used, nobody likes to be valent, right? And the people in the 26 counties have been fed upon a diet of free state propaganda since 1921. The Fianna Fáil, whose roots they split from the Republican movement in 1926, they're still deeply nationalistic. And they're the aim, and it's enshrined in the constitution of the free state, is the reunification of Ireland. Yes, but it now, doesn't, doesn't support the reunification of Ireland by the violent methods you use. No, but they retrospectively endorsed the 1916 raising, which hadn't got the support of the people. Well, you could say this was their dishonesty, but they still don't support you in your violent methods today. The IRA's mandate in the North is from the oppressed nationalist people. Certainly not the middle class nationalist people, but from oppressed nationalist people. That's where it draws its support and that's where it draws its mandate. You say it as a mandate, but where does it get this mandate from? It's certainly not at the free elections. By the perpetuation of its struggle. Would you say that the provisionals are politically motivated? No. I wouldn't, because um, they've got no political motivation, as we understand it. They're, they are just in the business of destruction. Would you say, therefore, that they're mindless? Well, to my way of thinking, yes. If the IRA were just mindless hooligans or criminals or godfathers, then why are they tolerated within the Catholic people, in the Catholic areas where they draw support? <laughs> A Republican social evening in Anderson's town. Most Irish Republicans reject the IRA's violence. 
what has been put forward in the name of republicanism by many people in modern Ireland, which is not republicanism at all, it is in fact extreme nationalism, something which puts forward a very narrow sectional view of Ireland, a view which takes little account of the differences that exist in this island and of the existence of a very large tradition in the northern part of the island a view which thinks that it's right not only to kill, but to die, to enforce this view, this sectional view of Ireland and people. That's not what I believe, and I don't think that's republicanism at all. I think such people have stolen the word. Uh, republicanism uh, ought to mean t for anyone what its original definition meant on this island, the coming together of Catholic, Protestant and dissenter. And what I would want to see on this island would be an agreed Ireland, one which all its traditions agree, an Ireland which is, of course, independent, and one which uh, has a role for all sections of the Irish people to play. Cross Maglen, South Armagh, a solid Catholic and nationalist area near the border with the Republic. A heartland of the IRA, together with Belfast and Derry. The British Army is present in almost ostentatious force. have gone off here. British soldiers have been killed. Some of the 335 killed in the province in 10 years to the end of 1980. But the border nearby can be crossed with ease and the army presence in the town itself could be seen as politically counterproductive. The townspeople feel occupied and harassed by troops who are foreign to them. And the IRA case is actually strengthened by the very measures intended to defeat it. I couldn't describe it in words, to be quite honest, with what we feel our attitude towards the British Army. Because they're here. Someone described them as a festering irritant. That they will all, the sore will never be cured while they're, while they're here. And one should always remember that the people here feel that they have a greater moral right to walk up and down the street in freedom than the army have, you know. And the local people will never stop the army, but the army's always stopping the locals. You and Jack Fang up there. I think they, it, it, it's up there in a provocative manner. When the army came here first, they never flew the Union Jack. It's the last two or three years, the, the fly it. Nevertheless, this is part of the United Kingdom, isn't yeah. it? So that it, it, perhaps it's all right to fly the Union Jack. Mm -hmm. This is part of the United Kingdom against the wishes of the vast majority of the Irish people. And it's held here by force, as you can see in the streets below. Cross Maglen, Catholic and nationalist anyway, is a special case where subtlety rather than force might have served better against the IRA. But the greater part of Northern Ireland doesn't have to be held by British Army force. It's held by the will of the Protestant people here who are proud to be in Ireland under the Crown. For them, the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne on the 12th of July is a happy day out to celebrate the security of their way of life. For the Northern Protestant, the British crown is a symbol of that way of life which they wish to preserve and are determined to preserve at all costs. Our loyalty is strong to Her Majesty 
and it exists within the United Kingdom, so long as Northern Ireland is within the United Kingdom, and would exist even if we left the United Kingdom. At all times, we'd be loyal to the Crown. Because, as I say, even if we left the United Kingdom, we would not go into a foreign Republican state. The Crown may be irrelevant to you in England, but certainly in Northern Ireland, we have a basic loyalty to the Crown. We support the Crown, we work for the Crown. The Crown to us is the head of the state, and that's where our real loyalty lies. And uh, we could not replace the Crown by some kind of Republican president. The man who, before the First World War, built the tradition of implacably Protestant resistance to rule by the rest of Ireland was Edward Carson. Do you see yourself as being, in a way, a successor of Carson? Oh, yes. I mean, Carson, it's just unfortunately we haven't got one at this present stage because it's perhaps something that could bring us all together. But certainly I do. I see myself in the same mould as Carson, and his old saying was not an inch. My saying now is not a blade of grass. But, in fact, Britain has constantly repeated over and over again that there can be no question of breaking the link between Northern Ireland and Britain until the people and Parliament of Northern Ireland want it. Why are you so worried? Well, I, I'm so worried for the simple reason that we have heard all these promises before. And if someone had said, uh, this government, especially Maggie Thatcher, a great catchphrase of her is no U-turn, but in fact, on many occasions, she, she would be prepared to go into full reverse. And this is what I would be most concerned about. And supposing that link were to be broken, what would happen here? Well, I would say that that's a receipt for uh, a civil war. Absolutely no question about that. Because there's no way that a million Protestants in Northern Ireland are going to sit back and be pushed into the United Ireland against their wish. If there were the civil war here that you fear there might be if Britain were to withdraw, do you think the uh, Protestant population here would be able to defend itself and, and ward off any attempt by the rest of Ireland to make a united Ireland? Yes, I'm convinced of that. I think the, the Loyalist paramilitaries proved exactly what they can do. One always remembers the deeds that the Provost done, but when one thinks of the violence and the counter violence, one would have to class it as in 1972, 73, 74 and 75 that the Loyalist paramilitaries uh, committed. I, I'm quite uh, confident that they can look after the interests of the Loyalist people. The only way to beat any terrorist is to actually terrorise him and have him what he is more worried than the person he's looking for. And I don't think that has ever been a, a, applied here. I think the IRA has got a very, very soft passage because their attitude is, well, when we are cornered by the security forces, we can immediately put our guns down and put our hands in the air and surrender. But an IRA corner a soldier or a member of the UDR, they will just simply shoot him, irrespective of whether he surrenders or not, whether there's families about. And I think if, if the security forces, and I'm talking about all the security forces here, could learn to terrorise the terrorists, Roughly about three years ago, I recommend that this should be done by paramilitary organisations. And since that, there's quite a few members of the Republican groups have been assassinated. But the real problem of Northern Ireland is more difficult than a battle against IRA terrorism, whether by Protestant paramilitaries or Orthodox security forces. This is not just a problem of Northern Ireland. It's a problem of Ireland. The problem of the majority of the Irish people, mainly in the South, with an aspiration for national unity, unable to persuade the substantial Protestant section of the Irish people in the North to join together with them. The Republic's own individual independence is more satisfying to most people in the South than much of the political rhetoric has allowed it to be. Many discreetly fear the challenge which the entry of the Northern Protestant into their self-contained Southern society would offer. But it is a nationalist republic, and Irish nationalism can never be wholly fulfilled while part of Ireland remains under British rule. The problem for the republic 
is how to fulfill that aspiration, which they share with the IRA, while at the same time continuing to reject, as they do, the violence of the IRA and emphasizing their difference from them. Our aspiration is a legitimate aspiration. We intend it to be pursued by political means. We, we want to persuade. We want to offer guarantees. We want to offer safeguards. We want to sit down and talk and discuss. That, that's probably the basic difference. But there remains the implacable hostility of the Northern Protestant. Charles Hockey made a wonderful speech yesterday in the dawn. And he said the people of Ulster would be amazed if they knew what he was going to offer them. Come into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. It's the nicest little parlor that ever you did spy. I want to tell Charles Hockey that Ulster Protestants are too dead fly to go into his little parlor. We'll not be there. No surrender. That's our answer to Charles Hockey. Real root of the problem is the guarantee, the flat-footed, uh, unremitting guarantee which the British government extends to the Unionist um, section of the population in Northern Ireland. I want to, if I can at all, to the British government and the British public, identify that, isolate that as the stumbling block, the great, big, immovable object. And until such time as something is done about that, some modification, some way around it, is found, there will be no movement. Only some movement by someone can stop the killing. When the British Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher, went in December 1980 to Dublin to meet Charles Hockey, she took with her three of her cabinet. Full details of their discussions were not revealed. And in one sense, our history stops here. But what signs of movement are there in people's minds? On the Ballymurphy estate in Belfast, a Catholic and nationalist family watched the program in this Ireland series, with its writer, about how their Protestant neighbours came to be in Northern Ireland. However peaceful the scene outside, however industriously the settlers might work the land, they were not a massively planted colony at all, but isolated individuals. Not visibly distinguishable, except that, as the new Protestant settlers put it, Catholics dug with the wrong foot. <laughs> Didn't they always? <laughs> they hear of the atrocities committed by Catholics in 1641. Grisel Maxwell, being in childbirth, the child half born and half unborn, they stripped stark naked and drove her to the black water and drowned her. Not 20 of these Protestants of that parish escaped the merciless hands of the rebels. They watch a parade of orange attitudes which have often seemed to them inexplicable. I'm very particularly sorry for those that believe in the Roman Catholic faith because I think they're living in idolatry. They're living in darkness. Jesus It's a memory of triumph which the Protestants of Northern Ireland still need as part of their everyday lives. But why do they still need? What do William of Orange... Do you think the sort of thing people are going to learn from this series is going to help them to understand each other better and look for a solution a little more easily? Well, I think it's going to show two sides of the story. I just about watching that and it you shows think... that because uh, you see that part with the catholics with the although there's propaganda on both sides as you say 
But I think it's going to prove too that uh, there's two sides to every story, and now we know there's a reason for all this. See, we never really we had... We never were taught nothing yeah. like that in school. Yeah, so that there was some, perhaps, sense of grievance that the Irish and also in some sense of grievance because their land had been taken from them and they felt they had the right, perhaps, to try and take it back. Um, in the good schools of Northern Ireland today, like this Catholic grammar school in Belfast, good teaching of two sides of the story of history is beginning to work through to the present. These are some of the people who will live in Northern Ireland's future. Will historians say that the IRA were right to use violence in order to try and make a united Ireland? Yes. Sir, sir they, are, they were wrong to, in the matter and all the people they killed, sir, because they were killing innocent people. So are someone Catholic? I might think they're wrong because if they know about Cromwell and all, it's just like letting history repeat itself because of all the wars they were having. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, they're, not, they're not right to kill people. Like, they just go and they, don't, they just want to get publicity for themselves. They just want to go in and bomb somewhere and they think they're great, like they're big men. So they're, they're both, uh, so they're both, they're both um, right in some aspects, but they're mostly wrong, I'd say, because it's stupid killing innocent people, because then their families, if, say, the IRA killed um, me, well, my, my, my whole family would be against the IRA then. Sir, um, it's sort of half and half that um, there's some good points that the English are in here, sort of like maybe it might bring more trade, they might be able to handle this place better, but... Um, there's some other aspects that they're sort of intruding into the Irish culture, sort of trying to make them more English instead of um, letting them live their own way. So the Catholics and the Protestants are never both going to get what they exactly want, but they could make some sort of compromise in between. Do you think, in the end, that all Ireland ought to be Irish? So maybe it's better the way it is, because if the English go out, then maybe Ireland will... Uh, there'll be more fights between the Irish themselves. Mm. Sir, I think it would be better if it was all Irish because there would be no more uh, trouble and encourage more industry and all to come back. So, so, so about the IRS, so, so say let get all the Protestants out. So, but they've been here for generations and they feel it's their land too. They've worked on it and they've farmed on it and paid for it and they think it's their land too. Well, sir, 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 there's just two ways, sir. If, if you leave it like this, sir, there's going to be trouble. Sir, if you don't, if you don't, if you give a united, a united Ireland, so there'll still be trouble, so because it'll be like the Protestants in, in England in 16, in Ireland in 1641. So the Protestants aren't going to take next county, so to, to be so in United Ireland, so, so there's still going to be a lot of trouble. There would be trouble if the British government withdrew and uh, did not negotiate with the rest of Ireland. But what sort of trouble? Well, presumably the loyalists would not want, would not tolerate the nationalist people within their boundaries. Exactly. Right. Well, then, having said that, and you haven't said exactly, you should realise then that it's the loyalists who are opposed to the equality of man, I'm not just, the Irish people. I'm just asking you what you think would happen when you get that situation. Well, we would hope that they would be realistic and join hands and accept an olive branch and we'll work together to build a good country and a peaceful country, because that's all we're after, is peace. And supposing they thought they were being more realistic in having nothing to do with your olive branch? Well, those are questions which then you would have to put to them to see what they were about to do. If the British alone decided to withdraw from the Ulster situation, the Protestants would go back into their traditional defensive camp and become very militant, as it did in 1912 to 1914, as it did in the early 20s, in the setup of the state of Northern Ireland. They all logic would go, be pushed to the side. We would fight for our very survival, believing that that would be the case. Uh, it's impossible for the British to alone withdraw from the situation. We say, those who believe in an independent Ulster, that both the sovereign powers who are involved and actually cause the problem here must draw, withdraw simultaneously, that the Irish must say that we are prepared to recognise Ulster nationalism 
and that the people in Ulster must determine their own future. And the British must say that we are prepared to physically withdraw from the situation and encourage the Ulster people to find their own identity. And that we must, without the influence of London or without the influence of Dublin, move towards our own future and find our future together. I stand firmly behind the union between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. All I'd say about an independent Ulster, and it has been floating around for the past 10 years, it never gets much support in Northern Ireland. It does not have much support in Northern Ireland. It only comes to the headlines every now and again when there is a, an increasing lack of confidence in Ulster of the will of the British government to defeat terrorism. Because then we think, right, they want us out of the United Kingdom, what are we going to do? And of course, what we would do if we ever had to leave the United Kingdom would be to fight to create an independent Ulster. In no way would we surrender to an Irish Republic. The loss of life, no matter who it is, even British loss of life, I feel sad at it. I feel sad that any life has to be lost. And it does trouble me quite a lot that so many people have had to die. Yet, I believe it's of necessity. People just will not lie down. I mean, we're told all the time, croppies lie down, but the croppies will not lie down. Croppies will never lie down. I mean, these young men who are out fighting today, they're no different from the men of 16. They're no different. Uh, they're a line in the unbroken chain of Irish oppression to British rule in Ireland from the for the last 800 years, from Wolf Tone in particular, he was the father of Irish republicanism. From that, all down through the centuries, all down through the Fenians and all the different phases of Irish history, they are the very same, They're the very same. Are such people trapped in their history, prisoners of it? The surviving men of 1916, of the IRA of 1920 and 21, have now grown old and their reunions are muted affairs. Gentlemen, I'd like you all to stand and say a prayer for our past members, people who died during the past year. Their tradition of violence is still hallowed in much of Ireland. It gave eventual freedom to most of that part of Ireland that wanted it. The souls of all the people departed. Merci, God, rest in peace. <coughs> The only source of income comes from our chairman, who has apparently many generous friends. I have three or four friends, I had three or four friends, who used to come to my aid by going to them and asking them to sponsor this and sponsor the other thing and sponsor the other. And they sponsored it. <coughs> but unfortunately, three of them are dead now. The facts of the present must be faced by these once ruthless killers. If you know any good people living in your area that can give you 10 quid to send it on to me. These men's successors, the present IRA, must face the fact that though their violence might, in the end, get Britain out of Ireland, violence now is destroying the centuries-old dream of patriotic Irishmen of uniting the hearts and minds of all the people of Ireland.